January 5th, 2020. <laughs> You're really fired up about it. <laughs> a new year. But at least we made it, right, through 2019. You're here to... You're here to celebrate. Um, we're starting a new series today, and I'm going to share with you what that series is um, here in a minute. But, um, you know, I tell people all the time, I do, a lot of, uh, I do a lot of counseling. I do especially a lot of marriage counseling. And when I'm doing marriage counseling, I tell people often that we live in the age of resources. Anybody here ever go on YouTube to figure out how to do something? Now listen, I am not a mechanic, but I am very cheap. And I have a truck that actually has an engine that runs it, not a computer. I have a 20-year-old truck, and so there's actually an engine in it, not a computer that runs that thing. And so when, uh, when, I, when something breaks on my truck, rather than bring it to the mechanic, Jody goes to YouTube. Because there's just tons of resources in YouTube, right? And so I'm, I'm counseling couples often, and I'm like, hey, go to YouTube. We know that there's trash on the Internet, but there's also good things on the Internet. I mean, go, if you, wanna, if you want your marriage to grow, go to the Internet and Google uh, Jimmy Evans. Go to the Internet and Google Emerson Egerich or Love and Respect or all those things. There's all those resources to help your marriage. If you're having financial trouble, uh, there's uh, Dave Ramsey, Right? If you need help with your investing, there's Dan Celia. There's all these, these Christian resources available to us today. And so we live in the age of resources, literally. I mean, if, if you want to give yourself a triple bypass, there's probably a YouTube video to explain how to do it, right? I mean, there's just tons of resources. So we understand this idea of resources. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because we're more committed than ever here at Victory. Our assignment from God is every believer a disciple. In other words, we believe that we, our call, our assignment from God is to raise up disciples. And so you're going to see us more determined than ever this year to be a disciple and to make disciples. Can I hear an amen? That's just what we're about. But Jody has a tendency of, I, I'm very goal-oriented, so I get something in my head like that, and if you're not careful, I will run over you with it. And I'll just be like, come on, come on, Jenna, be a disciple. Let's go. Come on, let's get this thing going. Come on, let's go, let's go, let's go. And what I felt from the Lord, what I, the check I felt in my spirit for me as a pastor, even though we have this assignment from God, is to not make you think that we can accomplish this in our own strength. Because this is not about us. You and I are not capable of becoming who God has called us to become in our own strength. We, you and I are not capable of accomplishing what we've been called to accomplish in our own strength. We need him. May we always make more of Jesus than ourselves. This, if this is dependent on us, it's doomed to fail. But it's not dependent on us. Thank God we have a Lord and Savior who is the head of the church, right? And who is at work in us. So this is about Jesus, not about us. And so um, we're starting a series today I'm calling Resourced. And the whole idea is, yes, we have an assignment, but we don't have to do it on our own strength. We have been resourced to be who God has called us to be and to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish. Can I hear an amen? So we're going to be talking this month about the different resources that God has given us. Here's the text. This is the verse that we're going to be using throughout this, um, throughout this series. And I really would like to take our time and I would like for you to take note of this verse because this is a verse that changed my life and I believe can help you. Here's our text for the, for the series. It's Philippians 2.13 if you've got your Bible Turn there with us. If not, it's going to be up on the screens here. Here's what it says. Let's read it slowly. Ready? For it is God. It's not Jody. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now I want you to focus on those two things. There's, it's God, but what is God doing? He's doing two things. He's causing me to will what he wills. I don't naturally will what he wills. 
I naturally will the opposite of what he wills. Am I the only one in here? Because I have a flesh, my will is carnal and is fleshly. So if it's up to my will, we're heading in the wrong direction. But it is God who works in me so that my will aligns with his will. It starts there. But not only does he cause me to want it, he actually gives me the grace to do it. So it is God who works in me, and he's working in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So the resource is not Jody. The resource is not victory. The resource isn't YouTube. The resource is God Almighty. So he is at work in us. So we're going to be using this, this verse to go through this series, and we're going to look at the resources that God has given us to accomplish what he's called us to accomplish. Are you with me so far? You guys are, like, not here today. I said, are you with me so far? Good. All right, good. The first resource, the main resource that we're going to start with today and the thing we're going to be talking about is this very simple name, the very simple word that we just sang about. It's the name of Jesus. The first resource that God has given us is the resource of Jesus. Now, the very idea of a kingdom, how many of you know we are part of the kingdom of God? There is a kingdom of God and we are a part of it. The very idea of a kingdom is predicated on the fact that there is a king. And our king is King Jesus. Now, When I say the name of Jesus, something pops into every head here. In your mind, in your imagination, you have this concept of Jesus. So when I say to you that the first resource that God has given us is Jesus, some of you are like, yes! And some of you are like, okay. It's based on on your perception, your paradigm, your idea of who Jesus is. So if we're really going to get excited about this, if we're going to put our faith in this, then we really have to understand who Jesus is, get the correct paradigm, the correct idea of who Jesus is. So the question is, who is Jesus? Not to me. The question is, who is Jesus to you? If he's, if he's going to be a resource that you're going to rely on, you're going to have to understand who he is. And to some of us, Jesus is a little flannel board character from Sunday school. If you're like under 40, you don't know what that is. We used to have these things called flannel boards. Can I hear an amen from the Baptist in the group, right? Before, before PowerPoint, we had flannel boards. And it was this little cutout character of Jesus, and you slap him on there. And that's great and all, and we love that, but some of us have never grown past the flannel board Jesus. That's all we know. We know the flannel board Jesus. But we don't understand who he really is. I was actually reading in the book of Revelation this week, and how many of you ever spent any time in the book of Revelation? You better have your big boy pants on when you go to Revelation, right? Got to have your hip waders on when you go to Revelation. The book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John. Interesting, he wrote the book based on a dream he had, a vision he had, while he was in exile on the Isle of Patmos. Now, all the other apostles had been martyred. Judas killed himself. The other ten apostles disciples were all martyred John was the only one who died of natural causes now before he died of natural causes he was actually there was an attempt of martyrdom on him listen how powerful this guy is he was arrested the way they were going to kill him was to boil him to death in oil now there was other apostles got shot with arrows That shot with arrows sounds better than boiled in a pot of oil. I don't know about you. They actually attempted to kill him by boiling him in a pot of oil in front of a crowd, and he didn't die. In fact, he wasn't even hurt. I don't know. I'm a guy with an imagination, so I just see him like he's in a hot tub. What's up, God? Yeah, can you turn that up? It's getting a little cool in here. That was how they tried to kill him. 
and, and he didn't die. In fact, he wasn't even hurt. And so they're like, what are we going to do with this guy? So the only, the, the next punishment was let's just get him out of here. And so they brought him to this island called Patmos and he lived in exile there and died, died of natural causes there on the island. But while he was there, he has this vision. And interesting vision, the whole book of Revelation is about this vision. You know, if you go to, to chapter 4 of Revelation, you'll see that he begins destri- describing the throne of God. Anybody ever read this? It's like I'm hearing the words and I still don't know what it means. It's like he's explaining the one who sits on this throne and what he looks like and his words fall short. Can I tell you there are not enough words in the English language to describe God Almighty. He's sitting there looking at this throne. It says lightning and thunder are coming from this throne. There's a crystal sea out in the front of this throne and he's explaining the whole whole setting and I'm just captured in this as as I read. It says the throne is surrounded by 24 um, uh, chairs, which the elders set in. And the elders have crowns on their head, crowns of gold. And so here's the throne, 24 chairs around it. And then it describes real casually, like we understand what he's talking about, that there's these four beasts. Have you read this? There's this four beasts, and they're, they're around the throne as well. Interesting beast. One of them has, one of them looks like a lion. One of them looks like a calf. One of them looks like an eagle that was flying. Does that strike anybody but me? How do you look like an eagle that is flying without flying? And the other one looked like a man. These beasts had six wings and they were covered in eyes. Are you with me? Is your imagination working? So this, this is the setting. And it said that these beasts... All they did was worship. And they would sing out. They would would sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and was and is to come. And when they would worship, the elders would take their crowns and throw them down and hit the ground. Now it's said that the angels never stopped doing this, so I suppose that the elders never stopped doing this. It's like, worship, get up, crown back on, they sing again down we go again that's funny you're not laughing but that's funny I don't know what that looked like but that's that was the scene and and let me just give you a side note this doesn't have anything to do with this week it has to do with my message on worship a few weeks ago here's a little theory I have you ready for this this is free I don't think God assigned those beasts that song I don't think he said okay listen I'm going to create you beasts your job's going to be holy, holy, holy. Say it with me. Holy, holy, holy. These are your lyrics. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I don't think he did that. Here's what I believe. They're covered in eyes. So they see God. And when they see God, they don't have to be taught the song. When I see who he is, I can't help but saying holy, holy. Can I tell you, church, we'll never have the perfect song for you to worship without seeing God. But when you see God for yourself, it doesn't matter what the song is. It comes out of us, right? So here's this setting. There's the angels, there's, I mean, the beasts, the elders, there's the throne. And it says, beginning in, when you get to chapter 5, it says this, that, that um, the, the it, God, the one sitting on the throne, had a book, and this book had seven seals on it. Now, we're talking about Jesus. I'm getting there. You with me? You got your patient? So God's got this book, and this book has seven seals on it. And, and God begins saying, who is worthy to open this book? Who is worthy to open this book? And there's nobody in all of heaven who is worthy to open this book. And John actually says as he's writing that he burst into tears and began to weep like, oh my gosh, why is there no one worthy to open this book? And he was getting shook up and the elders said to him, whoa, 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 wait, wait, wait. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Listen now, follow me. We can get excited in a second, but I need you to hear this. So here's the elders say, listen, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. 
He has overcome and can open the book. Who is the lion of the tribe of Judah? Who is the root of David? It's Jesus. So they say to John, behold the lion of of the tribe of Judah. Now, I don't know what went through his mind when they said, behold, if I were to tell you, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, what would you turn expecting to see? But when John turned, what he saw is possibly, the Bible doesn't say this, but it's possibly not what he expected to see. Because when he turned, he saw a lamb that looked like it was slain. So behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, but he looks like a slain lamb. Do I have you right there? I can sense it. I love having you right there. I just want to keep you right there because you're actually engaged. I can feel you leaning in right now. So the question is, is Jesus the lion or the lamb? The answer is he's both. He's both. He came. He came to this earth as the perfect sacrificial lamb was brutally murdered for my sake and for yours. But church... He is not just a lamb. He is not a flannel board Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the ruler, the king, the the one who lives and, and was dead. He is the one who has overcome. He is more than a flannel board Jesus. But if all we ever see him is a flannel board Jesus, then we'll never use him as the resource that he has been given to, uh, to for us to, to be who God has called us to be. So I'm challenging. The reason I told you that, because I want to challenge your idea of who Jesus is. He's not this meek, weak, helpless man. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. As the lion, as the lamb uh, who looked like he was slain came and he took the, he took the book. The Bible said that the beasts, those beasts began to worship. The elders began to worship. And then John said, as he listened, he could hear thousands and thousands and thousands and 10,000 times 10,000 of angels join in this course of worship for the Lamb. And here's what they, here's what they sang. Here was their worship. It says, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing." When they saw who he was, is he the lion or is he the lamb? Yes, he's both. But heaven came to a realization of who he was and and what he had done, and worship began to erupt in heaven. I believe in our churches, the more we get an understanding of who Jesus is, the more worship will begin to explode in our churches. I believe uh, that, that we'll just be able to, we're going to begin to pour out into our community the worship and love and admiration for our Savior. But if we don't have an idea of who he is, we'll never get there, church. Wow. question is, who is Jesus to you? We have to get that right because he's been given as the first resource. The hope of anything we are to be or to accomplish is in Jesus. But it begins with who he is. Let me show you in scripture. I went through and I found a few things. And I could go on for days about who he is. But I want to show you from scripture some, some, some of the attributes of, of who he is. First of all, scripture says that he's the son of God. He's the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's the giver of eternal life. He's the one whose name brings salvation. He's the one whose name gives us victory. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one who supplies all my needs. He's God's expression of grace. He's the one who brings peace. Now listen, I got to stop there because I'm not talking about feel-good peace. I'm not talking about this idea that I'm calm. No, he brings peace, which means nothing missing, nothing lacking. I'm healed, I'm whole, I'm delivered, I'm set free. He's the one who brings peace. He's the head of the church. He's the mediator between God and man. He's the light of the world. He's the very nature of God. He's the servant. He's the one who came to seek and save the lost. He's Emmanuel, God with us. The one who sets us free from every sin. 
the one who empowers us to become a new creation and a conqueror. He's the word made flesh. He's the redeemer. He's the one who walks on the water and calms storms, storms with his voice. He's the vine that makes us fruitful as branches. He's the fullness of deity. He's the bread of life. He's the one who began the work in us and the one who will finish it. He's the cornerstone, the gate, the one in whom God placed his seal of approval. He's the fulfiller of the law. He's the first and the last, the one who liveth and was dead. He's the lamb of God. God slain from the foundation of the world. He's the one who set the captives free and led captivity captive. He's the defeater of death. He's the risen Lord. He's the soon coming king. Those are just the ones I found, right? That's who Jesus is. Come on, let's give the Lord praise here today. You're not a flannel board, Jesus. That's who he is. Well, what has he done for us? If that's who he is, then what, what has he done for us? Here's what I found. First, he lived the life that you and I could not live. The reason Jesus came in the flesh as a man is because we as men had blown it and we couldn't get it right. So God came as a man to get it right. The Bible tells us that he was tempted in every way that you and I will ever be tempted. There is no temptation to mankind that Jesus did not overcome. So we can't hide behind our little excuses like, oh, I'm just, I just don't have any authority there. I don't have, I'm weak in this area. Listen, if Jesus did it, we can do, do it, right? He lived the life for us that we couldn't live. Second, he died the death that you and I deserved. You and I deserved the cross, not Jesus. He died the death that we, didn't, that we deserved. He broke the power of hell in the grave. Listen, death is not going to be victorious over us, church. Death cannot hold us. Fourth thing he did was he broke the power of sin. Fifth thing, he rose in victory so that you and I can have victory. God did not create us to be under circumstances. He created us to be over circumstances. He called us to be victors, uh, victors amen? And so that's what he's done for us. Number six, he gave us back our identity. Number seven, he gave us the keys to the kingdom. And number eight, he left us his Holy Spirit. So who Jesus is and what he's done for us, those are eight things that he's done for us. Now, what does this mean for you and me? You taking notes? Gee, I know I'm going fast. That was my point, and I was expecting to get a laugh out of that, but no. So we talked about who he is. We talked about what he's done for us. Here's what does this mean for you and I? Okay, here we go. First, it means we have been reconciled to God. Because of who Jesus is, you and I have been reconciled to God. And we ought to shout amen to that because we were separated from God. We were separated from the holy God because of sin. But through Jesus, through the blood of the sacrificial lamb, you and I have been brought back into relationship with God our Father. We have been reconciled to God. Secondly, we have been given new identities. We have been given new identities. I am now the righteousness of God in Christ. That isn't who I was. But it is who I am now. I am now more than a conqueror. I am now a son of God. I am now part of a kingdom of, of kings and priests. God has given, Jesus has given us our identities back. Number three, through Jesus, what this means for us is we have God's blessings on our lives. That I now, I now have the inheritance of a son. How many of you would love to just be the child of a really, really wealthy person? Well, if you're born again, congratulations. You're not, you're not the child of a wealthy person. You're a child of the living God. It is all his, right? And we walk in his blessings. And so we now have his blessings on our lives. Number four, what this means for us is that we can operate in his name. We can operate in the name of Jesus. Even when we pray, all of you, when you finish your prayer, before you say amen, you say, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Why do you say that? Because mama told me to say that. Because that's how grandpa prayed. Do you know why you pray? You know why you say that? I'm about to help you right now. Here's why you say that. It's because Jody has no right to go to God. And the name of Jody has no entrance into the kingdom of God. But it's through the name of Jesus. Because Jesus is his beloved son. And so when I go to God in the name of his beloved son, then everything that is due the son, Jody gets. 
The same authority, the same entrance, the same blessing. Come on, somebody. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray because I don't want to go in my own name. So we can operate in his name. Fifthly, what does this mean for us? It means that we are now his ambassadors. You and I should be living our lives in the same way that Jesus lived his life. What Jesus was about on earth is an example of what you and I should be about on earth. What was Jesus about? Jesus was, was he's, he's the one who said, listen, I don't say anything unless I hear my father say it. I don't do anything unless I see my father do it. I am tuned in. I am dialed in with my father. And I am bringing the will of heaven to earth through my life. And we have now been called to be ambassadors for Christ. To live in that same way. So Jesus, he's not a flannel board Jesus. He's more than you think he is. He's done everything that needs to be done for you. He's done it. We have new destinies now, new identities because of Jesus. So Jody, you might say, what do you want me to do with this information? We clapped, we got excited about some things, but what do you want me to do with this information? Here's what I want you to do, okay, you ready? This all boils down to this. I'm asking you, to put your faith in Jesus. Not, listen, not just for salvation, but the idea that he is the resource that is going to bring you where you need to be brought to. Put your faith in the fact that it's Jesus who is going to help you walk. It is Jesus who is going to help you accomplish. Put your faith in in Jesus, and I'm going to show you really practically how to do that. It's what I call working the word, okay? So I'm going to show you this in closing. Here's what I want you to do. I would like for you all to stand up with me right now. Stand up with me, and I want to lead you as we close. I want to lead you in what I'm asking you to do. Now, while we're standing here, I want to give you my three top scriptures, my three top verses. Everybody right here, I need you dialed in. I'm letting you stand up. I need you dialed in right here. I'm going to give you my three top verses on this subject, okay? The, my first top verse I've already shared with you, but I want to, let's revisit it. It's Philippians 2.13. Here's the verse, ready? For it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Here's my second favorite verse on this topic. It's Philippians 1.6. Jump to that one. It says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in me will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So he who hath begun the work, who is that? Who, who, he who hath begun the work, who is that? Was it you? Did you begin the work? Work with me, church. Is it you? Who is it? It's Jesus. Jesus began the work, right? And so who's going to finish it? Is it now you? It's Jesus. Jesus started it. Jesus is going to finish it. That's my second favorite verse on this subject. My third one is this one, Hebrews 12, 2. You ready? It says this, looking unto Jody. No? Look what it says. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So again, he began it, and he's going to finish it. So here's here's what I'm going to show you right now. Are you ready? You fired up? All right, here's what I want you to do with this. I said that we're going to have to walk in our faith to understand who Jesus is as a resource given to us by God the Father. Here's how you do it. Here's how I do it. It's what I call work in the word. I take those three verses right there and I begin to declare them uh, over my life and I pray them. And here's what it looks like as we close in prayer. I'm going to pray and I want you to see how I pray and I want you to begin to pray this way, not just in this room, but in your living room. Remember that the word said that what happens in the secret place will be fueled by the Holy Spirit. So this needs to be your prayer in your secret place so that the Holy Spirit can fuel it. Here's what it looks like. I begin to pray, and I say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, that it is you who's working in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. 
Lord, I don't have it in me. Listen, I'm not teaching you. I'm praying right now, but listen. I don't have it in me, Lord God. There's no good thing in me. But it is you. It is you, Lord. And there is goodness in you. There is power in you. There is victory in you. So I can be something. I can accomplish something. I can become something. But it's not because of me. It's because of you. So I thank you, Lord, that it's you that's working in me to will and to do of your good pleasure. It's Sunday now. And so I need you today. I thank you today, Sunday, January 5th, you're working in me today. See how I'm doing that? I mean, literally, it's just that simple. Lord, today, you're working in me. And then I go to the next one. Lord, I thank you that it's you who began this work in me. Your word says that um, we can't even come to you unless we're drawn by the Holy Spirit. So I didn't find you. You found me. And so, Lord, you began this work in me. And I refuse to strive and strain and try to white-knuckle it because there's no benefit in that. There's no fruit in that. But just like you began the work in me, you're going to finish it. You're going to bring me to completion. You're not going to leave me a half-finished product. You're not going to leave me a half-finished project. Lord, you're going to bring me to completion. Lord, the visions that you have given me, Lord, the destiny that you have given me, I thank you that you're bringing me to that, Lord God. I'm not going to fall short. I'm not going to miss it, Lord God. I'm going to be everything you've called me to be, but my faith is not in me. Is anybody praying in here with me this morning? My faith is in you, Jesus. My kids are going to serve you, Lord God. Not because of me, but because of what you're doing in them. You're the author and the finisher of our faith. You're the one who began the work and you're the one who's going to finish the work. This is what I call working the word, church. This is to be done in your prayer life. And some of you are here and you don't know how to pray like this. You don't know how to stand in faith like this. But this is the way we get our victory. Jesus has been given to us as a resource. So if I'm going to be the disciple that God has called me to be, it's because of Jesus, not because of Jody. So I'm going to lean into that. Let me know if that's registering with you, please. Is, are you, is it written? And understand, I'm really not fishing for a hand clap. You understand, I really am trying to be practical on this. Does everybody, can can you give me a yes? This, This is what this looks like. So the whole idea is God has called you to be a disciple. And as a disciple is an identity and it's an accomplishment. But you can't do it on your own. And he knew that. So he gave you Jesus. But if your idea is a flannel board Jesus, then it'll never work for you. We have to get a correct paradigm of who he is. He's the lamb of God. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the soon coming king, right? That's who is resourcing me. That's who is resourcing me. Think about that American soldier out on the battlefield. He's just a soldier, but he knows that behind him is the might of the entire American military. How impressive is that? All the power, all the authority, all the might of the American, the U.S. military is behind this soldier. This is where you and I are. We're just, we're just a believer, but I've got the might of Jesus behind me. I've got the identity of the Son of God behind me. So I have to then put my faith in that. Because if I watch me, if my focus is on me, then when I fail, I'm going to think it's all lost. When I can't hold up, I'm going to think there's no way this is going to happen. But if I keep my eyes on Jesus and say, Lord, it's going to happen because you are faithful. You can do what I, have not, what I cannot do. Do you hear me this morning? Does that land with me? Do you understand that you are resourced by the kingdom of God? If so, can I hear a big amen?